your political source for 50 years. This is NBC4's News Conference with Conan Nolan, Southern California's longest running public affairs program. Please escort Speaker Elect Bass. On this edition of News Conference, for years they were power brokers at the highest level of state government. The names Jess Unruh and Willie Brown were synonymous with influence and control in the California legislature. Nothing became law without their approval. But the position of Speaker of the California Assembly lost much of its clout with term limits. Nobody lasted in the job long enough. That's about to change. In the Constitution of the State of California. With Anthony Rendon, the new Speaker of the State Assembly, who due to a change in term limits can potentially hold the seat for the next decade. Who is he and what does he want to accomplish? A conversation regarding the economy, education, and the role of government, and how California's new assembly speaker went from being kicked out of high school for poor grades to becoming one of the most powerful figures in state government. Good morning and welcome to News Conference. Anthony Rendon is the 70th speaker in the history of the state of California. He represents the 63rd Assembly District, Democrat from Paramount, a high school dropout who ended up getting a PhD from the University of California, Riverside. We'll get to that later. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. For thank you, Conan. So you've been on the job for a couple of months now. And we, before we get into policy, this is a job that has had tremendous turnover as a result of term limits. Most of the most recent assembly speakers have been two years max. You will be in this job potentially for eight years, ten years? Sure, eight years. So we're, talking, we're looking at Willie Brown-style uh, political clout. Uh, and I assume that's something that is part of the geometry of the decision making and what you're looking forward to in this session. Well, it's certainly something that I think the legislature is looking forward to or certainly something that the assembly is looking forward to. The uh, constant turnover of speakers is something that we we believe has had a, a detrimental impact on the legislature. And even just in terms of membership, having members only in Sacramento for six years, I think, and most people believe, has led to a decrease, led to a decrease in the level of specialized knowledge about various, uh, about various policy areas. That certainly had an impact with respect to the speaker. As you said, um, each speaker has tended to serve only about two years over the course of the The quality time. of the legislation suffered? Uh, cer certainly the, the level of expertise and the ability for, uh, for legislators to sort of sink their teeth into public policy areas suffered. Certainly the relationship between legislators and other parties as well. You could see staff got much more powerful during the short-term limited era. You saw the third house, the lobbyists get a lot more powerful during that era as well. Let's talk about some of the policy. First of all, you just have a budget agreement. Uh, this was uh, not acrimonious. It was fairly simple for the most part. Uh, that's what happens when you have a budget surplus. We're going to go over a few of the items. Still, uh, there was a downturn in the anticipated revenue to the state of about $1.9 billion. $1 billion going ahead, you have about $2 billion less than what you thought. So tax revenue has decreased. What does that tell you? Tells me that there are certain uh, danger signs uh, with respect to the economy. I just went, met with some folks from the Long Beach Harbor, Long Beach Port. They were talking about the, uh, how there are fewer shipments coming in from China and and uh, and Asia over the course of the past, uh, during this year anyway. So there's certainly uh, certainly warning signs on the horizon. We know the economy is cyclical. We know that recessions are inevitable. So as an assembly, we created the rainy day fund about three years ago. And this year, we're, we're uh, putting in about $2 billion into the rainy day fund to make sure that when inevitably the economy does take a downturn, that we're going to be ready for Some it. Some would say $2 billion is not nearly enough. It goes to, what, uh, $8.5 billion? $8.5 now. Well, let's go over some of the uh, items here. It sets aside $400 million for affordable housing construction, boosts funding for preschool and child care by $530 million, increases size of total reserves, as we mentioned, invests $200 million in college readiness programs. So as far as you're concerned, although you're spending more than you ever have, this is a responsible budget, despite the fact you just said that we could see a, a downturn or a recession anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. We also, as, as you know, we have record uh, number of homeless folks uh, who desperately need services. We eliminated $1.2 billion in early childhood education over the course of the past decade. To bring back $400 million uh, in early childhood education is good. 
but it doesn't come anywhere close to restoring us to where we were. These types of programs, these sort of safety net programs, these sort of development, developmental and education programs are really important for the future of, of California. You see an organization like the, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, for example, which called for the legislature to invest in early childhood education. That says something about how important the business community understands that these programs are. Still, there's an impression that we got with the governor of California when he released the budget admonishing the legislature to hold back on spending, reminding about the cyclical nature of the economy, and there was this impression that he was the adult in the room and that the Democratic-controlled legislature had plenty of programs to spend money on, and if it wasn't for the governor, you wouldn't have much of a reserve fund. I, I would take exception with that. As I said, the, the Assembly was, was the entity that created the Rainy Day Fund. We decided that we wanted to proactively put $2 billion into that Rainy Day Fund this, this there, year. There was no pressure for the governor to ease up on the amount of money he wanted to put on that reserve fund. I'm sorry, I don't think there, I mean. there was no pressure from your caucus to put less money into that reserve fund? Uh, we have a diverse caucus. Some folks wanted to put less. Some folks wanted to put more. $2 billion was a, a number that we all settled on and were comfortable with. Uh, every department goes up in spending, including corrections, correct? Correct. Uh, let me ask you about that. There was a ballot measure that passed by the voters in 2014 that was called Proposition 47. And on the ballot argument, and I can read part of the ballot argument for you, where it talked about how it would result in hundreds of millions of dollars into all sorts of programs for those who would be released from prison. Thousands would be released. Remember, for folks that don't know this, that drug crimes like methamphetamine, crack, a heroin, they are now misdemeanors and not felonies. You steal something less than $950, that's now a misdemeanor. Where is the hundreds of millions of dollars that this ballot measure passed, which I believe you supported, that's supposed to go into the community to help these people? Oh, a lot of that money is, in, is with the counties and with the cities. The county of Los Angeles has been asked saying, we're not getting nearly as much, and there's a suggestion that the governor and Department of Corrections is downplaying how much money it's saving. I've, I've, heard those, uh, I've heard those as well. We had uh, two oversight hearings about this in Sacramento, and, and we've, we've looked at that, we've looked at that uh, situation. I've been in contact with our folks at the, uh, at the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors to talk about this as well. Concerned about crime? Because crime is increasing as well. I am concerned about crime. I'm concerned about crime, and I think that's why when you look at programs like our reinvestment in education through local control funding formula, can see where you can start to start to cut into that crime by making sure that that kids have alternatives uh, other than than gangs and drugs. Still, getting back to 47, you have the mayor of Los Angeles and the county sheriff in Los Angeles County, who both will say it was an admirable goal, but now you have um, fewer people in drug rehab classes because prosecutors can no longer use the threat of a felony to entice those drug offenders into getting help. And remember, you can't force help on someone who's addicted to drugs. Is there a concern that there's an unintended consequence to this ballot measure? I think there are always concerns about unintended consequences with any proposition or any uh, piece of, uh, of public policy or legislation. That being said, we saw increases in crime uh, up until uh, the point where Prop 47 uh, was passed by voters. And it was an attempt to sort of see if we could turn that around. We're talking with Anthony Rendon, the new speaker of the California State Assembly. We'll talk about some of the gun legislation that's going through the California legislature and a little bit about his background when we return. Anthony Rendon is the new speaker of the California State Assembly. He's a Democrat from Paramount. There are a number of gun bills, anti-gun bills being considered now. They've gone through your house. They're now in the state Senate. One would argue that, listen, uh, we understand people want to do something after what happened in San Bernardino as well as in Orlando, Florida or Paris. But the guns that were used in Orlando, the guns that were used in San Bernardino were already illegal in California. What good does this new gun uh, legislation do? Well, in California, we've been passing gun control legislation long since before San Bernardino, long since before the tragedy in Paris or the most recent tragedy in Orlando. We know uh, statistically from looking at other countries and even comparing California to, to states with less stringent gun, gun laws, we know that, uh, that gun control laws are helpful in terms of uh, stopping both accidental deaths and, and in some cases deaths through robbery. Paris has the strongest gun laws in the world. Didn't stop, didn't help them. That's true. And there was a, an assassination in, in England earlier this week as well. But statistically and overall, um, we know that, that those, are, those tend to 
rarely occur in those places. Uh, anecdotal, there's anecdotal evidence of, of virtually anything, but as far as statistics are concerned, we know that far few, fewer people die in Europe and, and other places than they do in the United States. Let's talk a little bit about your philosophy of government. Uh, is there any area of society where government should stay out of? Um, I think things that sort of happen in the, in the privacy of people's homes, for the most part, I think should be off limits. Do you think the computer industry would have been better off if there had been greater government oversight? The computer industry with respect uh, to... Silicon Valley, that all developed in the applications you have on your phone, Uber and, right. and Airbnb and that kind of thing. Right. I think with respect to when things are in their nascent stages and in their infancy, I think it's important for let peop to allow people to, to sort of... Uh, think freely and, and act freely, uh, free of regulation. Once they hit the open market, though, you talked about Uber, you talk about Lyft, all of a sudden you have problems relating to insurance, you have problems relating to safety and all those types of things that really do requirement, require government intervention. Going back to the budget, how much money is spent on education, K through 12? Um, that is predetermined through Prop 98. I can't... That's I about 55% of the budget. Yeah, exactly. Is that enough? Uh, I don't believe it is, and it puts us 49th out of 50 states. Uh, did, uh, who said that? Uh, 49 out of 50 states. Uh, the statistic I have is from the Department of, uh, Department of Finance. Department of Finance. But, but does that include, for example, uh, bond money that builds schools? It does. It only includes bond money that's currently on the books, currently being spent. R right. Let me ask you this. $177 billion in the state. Let's take every penny. No parks, no highway patrol, no prisons, no health and welfare. We stick it all into public education. Would we have the smartest students in the country? It, it depends. It depends what you do with respect to curriculum. It depends what you do uh, with a lot of other aspects of, 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 of education. But is it money? Uh, in some instances, it is. In some instances, we have a huge population of 38.5 million people. Mo I've seen estimates that our current budgetary figures are sort of geared toward having a population of about 18 to 19. So money does matter, but no, you're right. We need qualified teachers, and we need to make sure we have facilities and, and other types of well, things. Well, some, some would argue that there is no profession where if there's a downturn in the amount of revenue coming in and you have to lay people off, that you don't look at their ability, you don't look at their uh, talent, you don't look at their enthusiasm, you only look at how long they've been working there. And that's tenure in the teacher in the uh, system in public education you satisfied with that or you like to see changes to that? I, I think I think I'd like to see changes where changes need to occur that being said I don't you were talking about the quality of, of public education in California I don't think we can fire ourselves into better education I don't think we can uh, have layoffs to better education what's important is what happens in the in the classroom what's important is the development of, of strong teachers we have a teacher shortage in California that is absolutely profound. It's, re it's reaching emergency proportions that nobody is really talking about. In terms of the CSU budget, UC budget, that, that's an increase. Increase of about $100 million. Do you anticipate greater control by the legislature over the University of California? Absolutely. Why? I was, uh, because we've seen that the University of California has at times not believed that, we have an, that they are accountable to the legislature. But why do we have a Board of Regents if, if it's up to the legislature? Well, because there are things, I, and I serve on the Board of Regents, there are things that, that we don't necessarily want to sort of micromanage with respect to the But, UCs. but is, don't you open up the Pandora's box once you do that? Because the University of California, in order to inoculate itself from politics, decided that's why we have a Board of Regents, and it's not supposed to be controlled by the legislature, is it? Well, it's not. The bu I'm okay with parts of the budget being controlled by the legislature. I'm okay with parts of the accountability structure being part of the le le being controlled by the legislature. And it's not too different than, say, say the uh, California Transportation Commission, which is which you know has their within within that realm of public policy. With respect to the UCs, we in the in the assembly have been very critical of the UCs with respect to their lack of accountability. We took on the UCs over their lack of accountability with respect to sexual violence a couple of years ago. More recently, we've looked at some of their enrollment, uh, their, their lack of enrolling out-of-state students, and, and we've seen that as problematic as well. So we've been very much engaged in those issues. And this is something earlier you talked about, the extension of term limits and being able to be here for a while. 
Being able to serve in the legislature for 12 years, which is the new scheme, the new uh, term limit scheme, is something that really gives an opportunity to sink our teeth in into oversight and making sure that government is responding to people and responding to the state. My first year in Sacramento, I chaired the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. It was a point in the history of, uh, of the State Parks Department where they were a complete mess. And I conducted three oversight hearings over the course of the six or seven months that I was there to get to the bottom of that fiscal mess. We're talking with the Speaker of the California State Assembly, Anthony Rendon, who has one of the more interesting biographies of any member of the legislature. We'll get to that when we return. Welcome back to News Conference. Anthony Rendon is the Speaker of the California State Assembly. You're from where? Uh, I was born in Los Angeles, raised mostly in Whittier. In high school was Whittier High? California High School in Whittier. And you dropped out? No, I uh, didn't drop out. I was academically disqualified at one point. <laughs> what happened? I was a good student. I didn't study very hard. I didn't find anything that was all that intellectually stimulating for me. Uh, before we get into your resurrection uh, in, uh, educationally, your dad did what? My dad uh, worked uh, for a, a mobile home company in Gardena. Your mom? My mom were, was a teacher's assistant at a Catholic school. How many uh, siblings? Three sisters. And so, um, but politics wasn't an early goal of yours. No, my parents are fair, pretty political in terms of voting and those types of things. I, there was a lot of discussion about politics around the dinner table. But They weren't happy when you got kicked out of high school. Oh, uh, they weren't happy when right. I Right, and so you ended up taking a job somewhere. I did quite a bit of work in factories and warehouses in Northern Orange County. So you know all about that. I know all about that. Uh, what was the turning point? I think the turning point was uh, I, would, I would take a, a bus past a community college every single day, and tuition was $5 a semester. And when the bus would stop in front of the community college, it would sort of jolt the bus, and it would wake me up, and I'd look out, and I'd see the kids. They were fresh and ready to go for their days, and I was tired and exhausted, and I thought what they're doing looks better than what I'm doing. What did you do then? I mean, you entered uh, JC, community yep. college? Yep, uh, Cerritos Community College. I took a couple classes, did okay, and then I took a class in philosophy. Uh, Plato's Republic was the first book I, I read uh, cover to cover for, for school. The first book on politics. First book on politics uh, that asked the question, what is justice? And I thought that's a pretty interesting question. And you went on to get a PhD? Got a PhD in political philosophy from UC uh, Riverside. And uh, I'm told your favorite place to hang at is the last bookstore downtown. I love the last it's bookstore on Spring Maine, Street. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Within Spring, right. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, how does how does political philosophy? Under, well, I guess it's a I've answered my own question. It it it's applicable to the job that you have now. It's applicable to the job I have now. I think what's important in the job I have now is to sort of stop and continually ask yourself that or that original question that was so captivating to me. That question: What is justice? Is is this act just? Is this policy just? If you continually go back and focus on that question, I think you're doing your job effectively. And this is completely out of sequence because I want to get back to one thing, but why is the LA River a priority for you? LA River is a priority uh, for me because it, we have the potential to have what I, I regard as a 51 mile uh, linear park. I represent communities, Maywood, Bell, Cudahy, Southgate, that are park poor. They don't have enough open space. They don't have enough uh, places for people to, to spend time outdoors. And you look at that 51 miles, that potential to, to have to have park space along the river, to have a bike trail that's, that's paved and, and, and that has drinking fountains. You look at that as an important, uh, important uh, opportunity for, for people to exercise, but it can also be an important linking opportunity for the entire, for the entire Southern California area. It's an it's a opportunity to link Long Beach with the Southeast cities, with downtown, with, with the San Fernando Valley. It's exceptionally exciting. That 51 mile linear park, potential linear park, is within half an hour of 10 million people. Uh, very quickly, a uh, lightning round uh, ballot measure on uh, legalizing marijuana, yes or no? Yes. Uh, the extending Proposition 30, the uh, tax hike, yes, yes or no? Yes. Uh, do we depend too much on millionaires in this state for tax revenue? We likely do. Uh, what's the solution to that? Spreading it out a little more? Spreading it out or, or looking at taxing, uh, taxing services, which we don't do in this uh, state. Change Prop 13 at some point? I've, I've talked about that for quite some time. Is it going to happen? Uh, it's nothing on the books now. Uh, would you uh, alter the California Environmental Quality Act, which the chamber says would increase the productivity in the state if you just didn't let anybody stop a project? 
I think uh, I think CEQA is good. I think what's bad is the abuse of CEQA. So there's reform on the books, you think? Um, again, there's there aren't any uh, proposals out there. But uh, I'll look at it if something uh, comes Finally, up. eight years from now, when you're saying goodbye to this job, what would you like to have accomplished? My district is a district where I represent nine cities. Five of those, uh, five of those cities have former council members in prison. It's ground zero for, for government corruption. When, I, when I'm ready to, to leave, I want my replacement to get two, three, four times more votes than I got because it means that the people then believe in government and they believe that sending people to Sacramento is, can, can be beneficial for their communities. Anthony Rendon, the Speaker of the California State Assembly, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll have some final comments after this. For the record, the State Assembly Speaker says his last name is Rendon, but others call him Anthony Rendon. He points out that either is fine considering the fact it is a bilingual state and has been since the state constitution was written in 1850. That's our program for today. You can see these segments again, NBCLA.com. Search News Conference one word in the search category. I'm Conan Nolan. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.